Um, a very brief personal introduction. Um, I have been in business media all my working life. Uh, I've edited magazines for the IOD and the CBI. I've set up a company uh, at Caspian Media. We launched Real Business, the first magazine for entrepreneurs. Um, I've uh, been involved in launching publications for uh, the private equity industry, um, working with uh, various august bodies, what used to be called customer magazines and is now called content marketing. Um, and uh, now I'm currently involved with uh, advising the Department of Business on um, editorial content for their great campaign and also generally how they can uh, talk to business. Um, but that's enough about me. Uh, we've got uh, a panel here who's going to make you think big and think openly. Um, I think just a few sort of thoughts before I introduce uh, each one of them, and they'll, they'll uh, talk, to, uh, talk briefly um, before we have a, our actual discussion. Um, benefits of open data, yes, well established. Yep. Increased transparency, tick. Uh, accountability of public bodies and services, tick. Um, makes uh, good for governance, public participation in decision making, tick. Um, economic innovation, uh, probably creates job and jobs and wealth, big ticks. Um, but is opening up data inherently itself a, just a good thing? I mean, isn't just about publishing the stuff. Uh, you know, just releasing material is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't of itself create value. Um, do we know how to use this data profitably? Do we know how to use it? Uh, do we know how to analyze it? Um, is the concept of open data, as we thought, still too abstract, uh, you know, difficult to engage with? Um, and then there's also the issue of that's just about the data that is being released. Then there's social media generating data about ourselves. I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to fancy there's going to be a very short, small show of hands here, but have um, any of you been to see privacy at the Donmar Warehouse? Ongoing? Right, no, me. <laughs> um, if you can, before it closes, do. It's very relevant in the context of today's conversation. Um, it's a piece of documentary theatre, so it's based uh, on interviews with MPs and journalists and teachers and lawyers and hackers and psychoanalysts and teenagers. Um, and there are comments and interwoven from everybody from Edward Snowden, of course, to um, guys like Clive Humby, the you know, kind of founding genius of the club card. Um, and it explores, among many other things, so... Um, the pressure that we are to continually narrate our experiences to bigger, wider groups. Um, and it makes very clear that we're less private, we're, you know, politically or socially or culturally. Um, and yes, we as humans love sharing information, but we can now do it on a far greater scale and to far more people than uh, hitherto uh, imaginable. So, um, down to us, to every one of us, to understand this environment and to try and make sense of it all, make sense of the ocean of data uh, and what the future, how that holds the future for communications, for customer service, recruitment and HR, or ourselves as individual citizens. So, um, on those opening notes, our panel, it was a splendid panel, um, uh, what I'll do is I'll invite each one of them to introduce themselves with a few opening words. Uh, so we know, uh, as we now say, we know where they're coming from. Um, and then we'll discuss some issues of the panel, but please do stick your hand up if you want to ask a question. Treat this as kind of question time rather than us having the chat. Um, and our first speaker will, um, to introduce is Catherine Corrick. Catherine's Head of Learning and Content at the Open Data Institute. She has been an independent digital comms consultant and she's worked with lots of people from the British Council to Microsoft and uh, um, the Technology Strategy Board. And, um, but she's also a journalist, really. On, previously, was online manager of the New Statesman and was chair of the Online News Association in the UK. Um, so, Catherine, for you, uh, intro. Thank you. Um, Sheila gave me no, no pressure at all with that introduction. Um, thank you so much. I hope I just live up to even a, a slight bit of that. Um, wow. 
The ODI, the Open Data Institute, um, is very, very new, as Sheila explained. Um, I was employee number six in December 2012, and my job was to help set up our training and learning um, business. So a lot of what Sheila was saying around um, how do you begin to tell that story around data, it has to be through... Uh, you know, a lot of I have lots of little memes that I tell my uh, our, our staff, and it's like story first, data second is one of them. Um, when we're trying to explain um, to others about open data, because it is, I agree with Stuart, it, it, it's a very abstract thing, um, and I'll, I'll come on in a second to maybe explain just how we understand it. Um, but also just thinking about um, Alan Turing, and I don't know if you saw in that intro video, it's um, 25 years of um, the web. And Tim Berners-Lee, who um, is the inventor of the web, not the internet, um, uh, is one of our, is our president and founder. And so I get the joy of occasionally meeting with him, and he is a lovely guy. Who, whatever you, you know, you, you sort of, it's like, ooh, and people do get rather excited when they, you, you get sometimes people in the office just getting really, really excited that they're in the presence of Tim, or Timble, as he's sometimes known. Um, but I think what, what I'd like to, as, as a, the key thought I'd like to um, put across to you is think back 25 years. Some of you might not be able to do that, um, but I, I, unfortunately I can think back 25 years. And just think what was possible then. Um, at that time, pre the web, um, actually mobile phones at that point weren't really that in common use. Um, communi how we communicate was very, very different. Think of, we still had a record industry. We still had a book industry. We still had so many industries that now have been disrupted in various different ways. So 25 years ago, actually, it seems a lifetime away for lots of different reasons. And, you know, the, the web itself was um, the beginning of a web of information. So where you could connect um, one thought with another. One of the reasons that um, Tim in invented the web was that he was at CERN, and it was really, really difficult to share documents. I'm sure you've all had this still at work, where you go, right, you know, you haven't got Word, you're using Google Docs. You know, th this was part of just trying to, trying to solve a problem of sharing information. Um, and so the web was this just easy connection of things. And the reason I mention that is that, you know, we, we've gone through now from a web of information and we're now living or beginning to live in a web of data where you can connect data together. And whether that's small chunks or really, really large um, bits of information. Um, no, sorry, data. I'll come back to why it's not information in a second. So, you know, imagine whilst, at, you know, it is very abstract, as um, Stuart was saying, the and we're still sort of on a very new, it's very new for a lot of us. Think in 25 years hence. Whilst, you know, the web wasn't that obvious what it was going to be used for, and I'm sure um, I, the, there was many articles a bit like the mail um, in 1940s. Well, what on earth is this for? Why would we want this thing called ACE? The same thing happened with the web. Why would we want this thing called the web? You know, I, I can talk to my neighbour, um, and all that sort of thing. It's that same sort of thing as happening with um, data and open data. So why do we want this? What does it do? And suddenly we can't live without it, you know, 10 years hence. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to see the small, you know, the, to see big pictures um, when we're living in it. Um, so that, that would be my, you know, if, if nothing else, think about history and just the longer term possibilities. Um, I'm not, I could go on and on and on, honestly, trying to answer Stuart's questions as well. Um, but I guess that I'm going to recommend some books. I love um, I'm not very good at reading non-fiction. I get bored really easily, but I love a good novel. Um, and so if I were to recommend two novels to you that connect, again, what, what um, Sheila was saying with some of what's going on today, it would be these. Um, Cryptonomicon. Has anyone read Cryptonomicon? Oh, I have friends in the room. Um, so Cryptonomicon, it was, it was written by Neil Stevenson quite a long time ago, um, sort of in the late... It was one of his first books in the, late, in the two, early 2000s, maybe late 90s. And it explains um, some of the, the code breaking that was going on uh, by Alan Turing, but connects it into deeper history as well. And it, it, it kind of um, thinks through as well this pot potential island um, in the Pacific Ocean, which they create as a data center. 
And um, it was what the possibilities would be if you could have this sort of free land where data was easily flowing and the web came to it. Um, so I, I definitely recommend Cryptonoicon, although it has got one of the worst written sex scenes in it. I, I'm really sorry for that. You just have to, it, it's just appalling. But other than that, the book's very good. Um, the other book is um, called Halting State by Charles Stross. And it's a novel set in a slight near future in Scotland, where Scotland is independent. And it, it, it was written in 2007, so it's before Google Glass. And everyone wears these glasses, uh, which have information and data um, that, you can, that you see on top of um, the web, so, uh, on top of life. So it's your, your life is augmented in different ways. And what happens in the book is that um, the police um, infrastructure has been corrupted and, a, you know, and, and is being used uh, for cr criminal purposes. And so what you get, begin to get, and I imagine if you're the police, you have all this extra data coming into you. Um, not, not just the bits that are open, but all the other closed bits as well. And in your glass, you can see if you go into a room, all the different crimes that have occurred just at the blink of an eye. Um, but this has become corrupted. And so it, you get this really fascinating vision of what might be possible um, in a few years' time. Also, um, his, ind his independent Scotland um, has the euro and not the pound. Just in case any of you are wondering what will happen, I think Charles Stross has it maybe right, you know. <laughs> so I, I could go on and on and on and on, but those would be the sort of, if you were to think about this area, these are some really fascinating kind of bits. Brilliant. particularly Thank from a sci-fi point of view. <laughs> so this was just, uh, uh, just trying to kind of um, explain the differences, perhaps, between open personal and big data um, and where the crossovers might be. So open data is publicly available data um, under a license that allows reuse and repurposing. Um, licenses can vary. The government has its own... This is where I go into, like, the advert at the end, <laughs> you know, where they do the... Blah, 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 blah. Um, the government itself has a license called the Open Government License, which is really, really very open and very flexible. Um, it's surprising what you can do with government data um, for both commercial and non-commercial use. But open data isn't just government data, it's any data um, that is released under um, an open license. So businesses, for example, which Monster, I think, are doing, um, are, you know, can release open data. Just few have done so, so far. Um, big data often gets confused. Big data is all about scale. You can get small data, you get big data. Um, big data you know, varies from what you think is big, but if it's beyond your computer, it's definitely big. If it's beyond your Excel spreadsheet, which can now do a million lines, it's definitely very big. Um, personal data, I... You know, should not be ever pu um, publicly available, um, except, and there is a little crossover which um, was, Declan was asking me earlier, so what is that crossover? And that's where there might be a, pu a public interest in personal data being open, such as um, MPs' expenses. There's other examples. There we go. Cool. And you get open and big where there's <laughs> scale and open. That's one thing. Well, we can come back to yes, that. that, that I'm sure we will. Part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, Declan, um, you're working with Monster.com um, as part of the team responsible for the delivery of the UK's largest job board. Over well, that, that, that's so. certainly very grand, definitely. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I read um, I read Halting State by Charles Stross, and actually, the opening of that book is, is absolutely genius because the first thing that you see is, is a letter sent to a um, uh, sent to a hacker. And it, it tells him why everything about his job is rubbish and why, why everything that, that, that could be in his world that could be good if he just worked for this new company. And that's, they, they recruit him to work with the police to solve that's the problems. Right. Um, but yeah, as a, you know, from a recruiting angle, that, that was very interesting <laughs> to me. Basically, yeah. Halting State will go all the way now along the, the line. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't read it, you're now in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys are probably looking at me thinking, where have I seen his face before? I'm sure you're all thinking that. Um, so. What you might have seen is me last week during the tube strike riding my skateboard. And this, this was in the e London Evening Standard. And that's probably where you recognise me. Um, 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 unless, of course, you, um, you, you've entered in any defence contracts in the last four or five years where you might have seen me on the front of BA Systems Global Brochure, where, where I, I used to be the face of cyber security. So I've got a couple of, a couple of different... Um, <laughs> disguises, depending you on... You have on. a good agent. <laughs> <laughs> They've still got me on there. I left, I left there two years ago, but they still, still use my face. Um, okay, so 
I'm interested in big data in HR and recruitment, and I've spoken previously about it, uh, uh, obviously because I've got the link with DWP's Universal Job Match, Monster run that for the DWP. It's the biggest job board that the UK or even the world has ever seen. If you take the, the top six job boards in the UK, add them together, they're still not as big as Universal Job Match. Um, and not many people know that Monster actually run that. So you know, it's kind of our claim to fame. But because of that, it means that we had to get a bit, bit down and dirty with um, big data. Um, you know, and um, it's led us, so I don't work day to day on, on maintaining and managing that system, but I, I work in, in kind of the, the government sector sales division where we're looking for other opportunities and, and, and value around um, Universal Job Match. Um, and one thing that we want to do is open up the data that exists within that. Now, there, there's, there's two big pots of data that sit within Universal Job Match. One of them is the job posting data, which is interesting because that is the demand for jobs and skills and, and people um, in, in the UK. It's fairly representative because it covers um, all of England and Wales. Um, and the other side of that is the, the, the CV data that people post up there. And that in itself is, is a whole different kettle of fish. And that, that crosses borders between open data and personal data, which make it much more, more sticky and, and, and harder to deal with. Um, but let's, let's move on. So you've heard of big data before. Uh, I, I've got a, a little way of testing whether something's big data or not, and we use the, the, something called the four V's of big data. Um, so these are kind of the criteria that you have to meet if you want to say this is a, a big data system or a big data project. Uh, the first V, I think I've got them in order, is, is volume. So that's kind of the sheer number of bytes involved. So if it's bigger than a spreadsheet, you can't fit it on your own computer, you've got to have a data center to house it, it it's getting there for its volume. Um, the second V is velocity uh, of data. So how quickly is this data growing or changing? Um, so, you know, there are some systems, there's banking systems that, that move at a ridiculous speed, but there's things like Universal Job Match, and, you know, we have something like we've had 5 billion page views in the last year, and that's still quite a lot in terms of job boards. That, that, that's the biggest data there is. Um, the next one, I think, we've got variety. So, data comes in lots of different formats. Um, and it comes with structure, without structure, and when you've got a mixture of those things, that kind of ticks the box for variety in, in big data. And the last one is veracity, which is a really cool word, and that's about how trustworthy your data is uh, and how you manage the errors and inconsistencies that, that are in it. Um, but I'm kind of glossing over those just to give you a refresh of what big data is, but I've actually got a really important V that isn't on the list, and that is value. And what we really want to do when we've got big data or open, or open data or personal data is obtain value from the data. Um, and we want to be intelligent in order to do that. Um, so I got my training in a world where big data was kind of the only data that we're talking about. I showed you me on the BA systems brochure. But um, I started off in a company called Detica, and we gained a reputation as the most important company that you've never heard of, uh, because we, we kind of did work with various three-letter agencies uh, around the world. Um, and my first four years there, I worked as a developer, so I was a programmer. I had you know, five screens in front of me, I had three PCs, I spent my days writing code. Um, when we got taken over by BA Systems in 2008, I, I kind of moved to the space of being a kind of product and technology evangelist, and that, that's how I got myself on the face of, you know, got myself to be the face on the brochure. Uh, I worked in what we call our nerve center, where I would talk to people about all their, their, their data problems and how we could apply our intelligence um, to derive intelligence from, from the data that they had. Um, so we would work for banks. And we work for insurance companies, and we would look for things like fraud that existed within that data. But we had to be very, very intelligent about how we processed it. Um, now, I've got a nice picture here, which, I, which you, yeah, I saw that you drew there, Look. which, which <laughs> means that we, we, we match. This is my, my, uh, my, my little pyramid. I think they call it the, the DIKW pyramid because it's data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, it stop, stops before wisdom. <laughs> We often just leave it at knowledge. Oh, well, I, I like wisdom. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's kind of a useful construct to, to communicate the usefulness of data. So when you just have data, when you just have numbers in a spreadsheet, um, you know, with, with no context, you're kind of at the level of know nothing. You, you know nothing. Um, when you start to make kind of reports on that data, you know, order it into things like graphs, um, you're at the point where you, you know something, you know what. You know what that is. Um, but actually... The answer to that is, so what? What do you do once you've got a graph? Does, does, that, does that help you? I don't know. Is it useful? Not particularly. So then you need to, to, to kind of get the human involved. And you need somebody who's, who's seen a lot of information uh, who can kind of generalize that into what we would describe as knowledge. 
and then you need kind of the human judgment on top of that for, um, to apply something that, that is, is kind of nebulous and, and very rare, and we call that wisdom. And when you've got wisdom and knowledge, then you have what, what I might describe as actionable intelligence. And that, that's a term that we used to use a lot back in, back in the old days. But I'm trying to bring actionable intelligence into the world of HR and recruiting by being intelligent with big and open data. Um, what else have I got to say? OK, so um, before I use up all my time, just a, a quick overview of, of Universal Job Match for you. you, you you've, you've heard the name. Now, now you can see the, see the numbers. We've got 6.7 million job seekers. Uh, we've got 552,000 registered employers. And um, we get 11,000 postings every day. And this has been going since November 2012. Um, but far and away the biggest job board in the UK. And um, you can see there, it, it certainly qualifies as a, as a big data project. Now, it runs, uh, and it works, and it's been very good. Um, you may have noticed actually maybe in the intro video that the unemployment figures in the UK have, have been on a steady decline and actually there, there is some correlation between the um, implementation of Universal Job Match and actually that number. <laughs> maybe. Um, but um, do you know what this feels like to me? In terms of the data, it's, it's a representative and up-to-the-minute snapshot of the country's labour market. Um, and it's also got some, um, some, some big pots of data in there. And what we want to do in Monster is start to open up some of the, uh, the job postings data um, and start to combine that in an intelligent way, applying our knowledge and wisdom um, with other open sources of data. And we want to create uh, you know, a very fully featured and, 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 um, and usable and useful portal for labour market information. So there's open data that comes from the ONS, through, um, through NOMIS, uh, through the Labour Force Survey, through census data. There's the, um, the UK CES LMI for All API, which provides a lot of this data that we're, we're interested in combining with. And there's things like the Skills Funding Agency that are also have their data open. And what we want to do is, is just give the best possible labour market information to um, public sector and commercial industry. And that, that's kind of where I'm coming from now. I want to start to be intelligent with the data. Have you got the data to correlate the thing between the fall of unemployment and... Uh, <laughs> well, they, they say that correlation um, isn't, uh, causation. isn't causation. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> but there is correlation. So <laughs> there we go. And this is just some of the, the views of our, our labour market information product. What we want to do, instead of just presenting you with statistical indicators, just numbers, we don't present you with data and information. We want to present you with actionable intelligence, things that you can empower your decision making with. And that, that's kind of where we're getting with this. Smashing. Thank you, Declan. Um, uh, Guy, Guy Stevens. Guy's a managing consultant in social customer care at IBM. Only a year into IBM, is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Guy. Um, but he's uh, been a, a was customer knowledge manager at the Carphone Warehouse, um, and he's described one of the world's leading thinkers on social customer care. Gosh. There you are. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I'd just like to say I'm really delighted to be here, actually, because I, I missed the first one. So, <laughs> absolutely. So, so it's great to be here and to see how it's sort of grown over the last year or so. Um, I remember somebody giving me two bits of advice when giving a talk, which was, you're the only one who knows what you're going to say, which I always find really useful, and tell lots <laughs> of stories. Um, so I'm going to start off just by picking up on a theme with, um, that uh, Sheila talked about with Alan Turing where he talked about sort of creating a, a machine that played chess, effectively. And was, it sort of sparked something in my mind. And you know, it's amazing we've got these bits of technology that allow us to look up that sort of thing immediately. And funnily enough, I'm from IBM. And in 1997, IBM created Deep Blue, which um, played Gary Kasparov in chess. So 50, 60 years on, it happened. You know, so it's amazing to see how things that we talk about eventually do come into play. Um, and I think, you know, at the, the basis of so much of what we do is, is data. And I think the challenge for all of us is actually, you know, and, and I, I certainly put myself in that category, um, and I know, you know, IBM is a huge data churning company. Um, but I think we're all, in many respects, at the outset of that journey. And, and part of the challenge is, our, we, we struggle to articulate what we mean when we talk about data. So when we think about it, we think about data, we think about privacy, we think about security, we think about information, we think about intelligence. And we sort of all mesh it all together. 
and we're not quite sure where to come at it or what it looks like. We know it has a value, but we're not quite sure how to articulate that value. And I think one of the biggest challenges we're going to, to have is, and I think, you know, as I said before, we're at the outset of that journey, is the shift of data that goes from the hands or the ownership of, or data in, the own, in, in sort of the hands of organizations. And I think we're starting to gradually see it shifting into the hands of the individual. Yes. And that wasn't paid for or prompted. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I genuinely sort of believe that. And we're starting to see it with things like, you, you may have heard of the term quantified self. So you've got the Nike fuel bands and stuff, where well, you're starting to be aware of the data that you yourself generate, and you're starting to take ownership of it. And a number of years ago, we sort of handed that over to companies like Amazon, like eBay, simply because we wanted that book, that pair of shoes, that trip, you know, that ticket. And we were prepared to sort of tick that terms and conditions, that security, all of that we ticked and we signed over for convenience sake. And I think what we're starting to see is the desire to claim that back. Okay. And I think that's going to be a huge driver as we move forwards to understand actually this whole question about data. We will also have enough data to sort of, you know, that will overwhelm us. The, the challenge will be always, what do we do with it? How do we approach it? How do we articulate it? What are, the, what are we actually trying to get from it? And I think often we don't really know what we're trying to get from it. And if you think about this whole, you know, for the last 10, 15 odd years, companies have all been trying to, to sort of pursue this idea, this ideal of the 360 degree view of the customer. 15, 20 years on, we're still challenging it. We're still trying to understand it. We're still miles away from actually achieving that. And yet we're still in pursuit of it. Okay. And so I think those sorts of things reflect the fact that yes, there is data out there and we create it all the time. Every time we log on, we check in, we take a picture, we post it. You know, at IBM, we can take 200 of your tweets and we can start to understand you in terms of your motivations, your behavior, your emotional state of mind, your life events. We can track all of that. You've got sensors in your windscreen wipers, so we know if a lot of people in one particular area are using their windscreen wipers, it's raining, or the likelihood is it's raining. We can use that. Insurance companies are using all that data to actually, or some of them are, to start to actually um, modify your policies based on actually what you're doing, your health policies, because they're tracking you through devices, through fuel bands. Okay. So we're at the outset of that journey. So I think on the one hand, incredibly scary, and there's a whole ethical issue around it. On the other hand, incredibly exciting, the fact that we can do all these things. So I think the challenge for us is actually to try and figure out what do we want from it all, and not to let it happen to us. I think at the moment, we allow data to just happen to us, and we're not making active decisions about it. We are in terms of security, but actually how do we as individuals want to use it? How can I use my data in an open way? You know, in a way that benefits me and what I want to do with it. What are those tools that I need? So I think one of the big issues or challenges, I'm using the words issues and challenges a lot, is if you go onto YouTube and do a search for Howard Rheingold and just do digital literacy, it's a very short little video. And he talks about five different literacies, um, things like collaboration, Authent uh, authenticity, I'm not sure, collaboration. But the typical things you would associate when you talk about social and social media. Okay. One of the literacy, literacies I feel we need to add into that is, is around data. Okay. Because it, it's going to become so prevalent in our lives and our ability you know, for that data to touch us in everything that we do. And not for organizations to use it against us, but to actually use it in, you know, whether it's coming back to this idea of sort of a Magna Carta type of idea, but in a way that is fair to all. But I think part of that is putting ourselves back into that position where we are starting to be in control of that data and start to own it. So I think there's lots of issues. And I've sort of thrown lots of ideas out there. Um, and so, you know, I think the challenges over the next few years will be about how do we start to reclaim that data and move away from effectively what has been a position of apathy towards it up till now. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. That's very interesting. Um, well, um, and I suspect that this is, you know, it's a good sequence here because uh, our, our last uh, panelist is Julian Ranger. Julian has been a, uh, an angel investor since 2007, but an entrepreneur first and foremost. He uh, formed, had his own business, uh, business which he grew and sold to 
Lockheed Martin in 2005, and he's now really focused on his um, new business, so or relatively new business, Social Safe, um, which I think we'll now learn about. Yes, I, I must thank Guy for the, <laughs> the almost perfect introduction. Tea up, is um, it? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I must, uh, just a bit of background, I did spend 20 years doing the military internet, and part of that was about bringing data from lots of different sources, bringing it together for the commander. The commander builds a big common operational picture, and then he lets that data out on a need-to-know basis. And that's what I think is going to be happening on a personal data front. And I'm here to talk about personal data. I will just say that we nearly bought Dedica in 2007, so you're very lucky you didn't end up with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I have the clicker, and I will, uh, will try and uh, work some slides. So I'm really about the personal data revolution. And there's kind of like a perfect storm happening in the next year to two years. You've got a much greater increase in people worrying about privacy and security of their own data. That's number one. Number two, you've got legislators who are starting to think about that as well. And you've got new laws coming in with the EU, and you really should look them up, the new EU data protection laws that are talking about data minimization principles, only get what you need, that you have to have explicit permission. All data has to be portable, and you have to have a right to forget. Huge things that are going to change. Just as you think you can use personal data, you're going to get a whole load of new laws telling you how to do it. And then, and this is really quite importantly, we talked about open data and using that, and big data, and going up that data information knowledge wisdom tree. Um, well. How do you do that? How do you get all of that mass of your data that is currently spread, if this is going to work, all over the shop? How do you aggregate that so that you can get value out of it and you can let others help you get value out of it? You can't. And that's a crazy situation. We are leaving value, though we're generating masses of data, we're leaving value on the table. And businesses can't help us as individuals get that value because they can't necessarily access the data. Now, there's all sorts of issues with your data being spread around in privacy and security. Issues of data loss as you move service from one to another and leave data behind. Data access because they don't allow you to go back into your history. So Facebook may have the timeline, but you can't actually query it. You can't put up there what you want. You can't find it. But the biggest issue of all is we can't aggregate it. What we actually would like is we'd like to treat ourselves, and, and Guy talked about a shift in data from businesses to people, and I think of this modern world that people are mini businesses. We are our own business with our own data. So we should really build our own repository of all of our information, not just social, but everything that we do. But who are you going to trust to do that? And I would say the only person you can trust is yourself. You're not going to trust a company with all of that data, all your finance, all your health, all your social data. You have enough problems trusting, if you do trust Facebook with just that data, or the bank with just your information. So what we're at is trying to work out how is that going to change? How are we going to get a change in behavior, which Guy's talking about? And so therefore, we've tried to do something differently. And it's a change, and this is why innovation happens. Just because the web has gone one way does not mean to say it's going to stay that way. So for SocialSafe, you will download our application, which, by the way, you can all get free, to your device. And then that application gets the data and takes it directly to your device. So SocialSafe, the company, knows nothing about you. In fact, if you do download, all I will know about you is your name, email, and country of origin. And that's all I'll ever know. And so you can now create and be your own data repository, and that is key. That is the key to the future, all right? And now you've got your own fully 100% private, and it's private because it's yours. We then do wonderful things to it. You've got to have the data scientists normalizing, making all that useful, and you've got to have a lovely user interface so that you can benefit from it. And there's an easier way of thinking of that data information knowledge pyramid, and it's one plus one is three. When you bring data together, you get more than the sum of the parts. And so what SocialSafe is about is encouraging users, starting with social data, but then moving to the rest, to recognize that that shift can happen. It can happen privately, and that you can get one plus one is three. But then you as businesses will want to now start engaging with users with their data and make three plus three is 10, 10 plus 10 is 30. 
So Social Safe will allow you to put your data in your personal cloud. Remember, you're in control, and this is the future. This is the shift from businesses being in control of your data, that personal data, that third element on the diagram you saw earlier, to you owning and controlling it, just like businesses do. You decide where you put it in the cloud. You have it on your devices, and then you can permission access others to come to it. So the shift that I see, if you like, the developing story, is you won't go to a big data repository when you want to talk about an individual. You'll go to big data for trends and things like that, what to stock, etc. You'll go to open data to see the trends out there and everything else that happens. But when you want to personalize, you'll come to me. And because you can do so in a more private way and a more explicit way, a deeper, richer way, you can do a lot more. And you can see the benefits that businesses have got from ERP systems like SAP and business objects, et cetera, over 30 years has just been immense. And I'll finish with my own little story that when I first did this for the Tornado fighter aircraft, I remember we said we'd get a 30% increase in efficiency when we connected all of that to the rest of the world. Right, just an individual. And efficiency means killing things, I'm afraid, in the military. Uh, when we finally did it, we got over 400%. So it was a one plus one equals four, right? Well, it's probably 80 if I worked out my numbers right. 400%, <laughs> it would be eight. It's huge, and that's what the individual can have. And so I see it, the story being a shift, as Guy said, from businesses to you as an individual, you control it. And as businesses, you've got to work out how are you going to tap into that and cater with the new laws, which you really must find out about. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Well, there you are. That's a pretty um, remarkable sort of tour of Dory's on in the first place about what the uh, situation um, is. And I'm going to start, I just, because we could start anywhere here on this. Um, that you, all of you have talked about the, you know, kind of in some way about the difference between data and information and knowledge. Uh, what sense about whether we, whether people, individual, at an individual level and as organisations, whether we actually know that what the difference is? Uh, I'd, I'd say no. Um, the reason being, when uh, so I didn't talk really about all the learning and literacy and all that other stuff that, that that's my day job, <laughs> and I was getting too excited by um, telling history stories. Um, so the first exercise we do on most of our courses is just say, so what is data? and get people to actually um, really just understand what data is in the first place. And most people think get data and information confused. Um, so I think we have a, because it is so abstract, it is just small elements. Um, and I can't remember the phrase off the top of my head we use, but it, it, it can be a number, it can be a, a piece of, uh, not even information, just an abstract item that I think people just don't know. Um, and I guess, I, when I was thinking through some of what you were all saying, I was, and does everyone care? What people care about is the result, um, the benefit they see, the, um, the new tool they can use. So when we often talk about, oh, what's open data and why is it benefited me? It's like, well, how many of you um, travel around London and um, you use an app to get from A to B and you know that your train's going to be late. That's using open data. Most people are experiencing open data on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't they don't know and really why do they care that do they need to care about that but so I, I guess it's mm -hmm. sure but do do people need to kind of care that much mm -hmm. um, and even though I work in the sort of data literacy business in some <laughs> ways I, I, I still kind of not everyone necessarily needs to or wants to understand what data mm -hmm. is but maybe maybe yeah, that's yeah well, well, that. I, I agree I think I think some people do need to know yes and I think the, the people that do need to know are the people <laughs> that are then enabling the people that don't know because you know, we, we, we need people that do know in order to come up with the analytics and, and come up with the methods of combining data and information um, to, to you know, then give tools to people that, that don't know to help them inform their decision making because that, that's what you want, want a tool to do. You want it to, to tell you whether the train's late or something. That, that's the end result that people care about. So yeah, some people need to know and some people really don't need to know or don't care but at least they still want the benefit from that. The only thing I would say though, is people have lots of fears, and so there is a perhaps a literacy job around um, fear 
Uh, so I was talking to my builder last week, and he said, so what do you do? And I was like, well, I'm having some work done. And he said, well, and I'd told him before I was just a trainer. I was like, right, that'll be nice and easy. Because like, who wants to explain the job that I do? It's really unusual. Um, and, and so I said, oh, well, I work for the Open Data Institute. He misunderstood. He said, oh, he heard data. And he said, oh, right, OK, do you sell data? I was like, no, 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 we don't sell data. I said, well, um, are you part of the dark web? <laughs> no, we're not part of the dark web. I'm not really doing anything around the dark web. Mm. Although, hmm, interesting that you know about the dark web. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, well, what is it? And so I explained that um, I, we were trying to ex um, teach people about what public data was and make it available to others so that um, for the benefit of society, economy, environment, etc. He said, oh, right, OK. And then he had um, this, his next immediate reaction was, oh, by the way, it's not like care data. It's, oh, don't talk to me about that. You know? And he had, his wife's a psychiatric nurse, and he knows how much protection is put into um, that work. And he, you know, people do have literacy around this stuff if you tap into what their experiences are, but it, they're not necessarily yeah. that immediate. They have literacy about their specific, But also fears, yeah. you know, yeah. his immediate fears were, oh, are you selling my data? Are you then doing something sneaky? Or are you then doing something with my health? Yeah, you know, yeah. I think that, and that's what we've got to be kind of really conscious of. Sorry. We, I, we do, but it's very interesting that, uh, you know, selling a product to consumers, although we do it by businesses, and businesses will be the ultimate consumer of some of that data as well, is we never mention the word data. We never mention the word information. We never mention the word knowledge at any point, because if we did, our, our consumers would go, what? <laughs> um, we only mention, and in fact, if you go to our current website, we don't even talk about the vision, really, because we've got to take people on a journey. And we talk about the whole story of you. Now, of course, that's your data. But it's not, they don't have no concept of what data is. And even that person, that builder, wouldn't understand data in the context of his Facebook or his other stuff, I would suggest. And so, therefore, we're all about the benefit. We have to show, which is exactly the point you make, you know, you use City Map or app to go around London. So we have to show that one plus one is three. We have to have compelling use cases where they go, ooh, there was a reason why I've now grabbed back all my data and I can do these things. If you mention the word data, it's like, death. Guy, where yeah. does it sit within the customer service field, this difference between what's data um, and information? Yeah, and if I can talk, talk slightly more broadly, I, I, th I think... You know, part of this is contextual, so the builder, it's, it's a context yeah. as well, and that context then di dictates the language that you use, so that you both suddenly understand, so when we talk about data, are we meaning the same thing, for a starting point? Um, I think there's an element of gener a generational thing, and I don't necessarily mean that difference in, in generation, I think simply we are working out a lot of these issues at the moment, and so there's a lot of confusion for us, so even people in the know will find it there's a lot to sort of navigate through. Um, and so I think in terms of, you know, my kids and their kids, a lot of this stuff they won't talk about. They'll have different concerns, you know. They will, their, their generations will be the result of the confusion that we're having at the moment. Um, so I think they will grow up with it naturally. And whether, you know, this, these conversations that we're having are a luxury for us, in a sense, you know, are we the only ones talking about it? Do we really need to talk about it? Um, I, I think there's lots of things we're working through. Um, and you know, from a customer service point of view, I don't think it matters which part of the organization you're in. These issues span the organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I think companies do need to think about is actually what is that experience for the person receiving that in the customer service context, so the resolution. Okay, and I think all too often we don't necessarily think about the way we deliver something. So, for example, you know, there's a big thing around social customer service now. All we're doing is actually taking traditional methods of customer service and putting it into Twitter, as opposed to saying, let's really look at the channels, whether that's from a data perspective or the actual channels, and actually think about designing the experience and the service from that perspective mm -hmm. with the individual in mind with context in mind. Yeah. So for example, if somebody's waiting in a queue, yes, we can design a resolution for somebody in that queue now. We don't have to wait till they're physically somewhere. Do you think, just sorry, this is being, um, do you think that um, companies do see data across the whole organisation? Because in my experience, they're not 
most people don't see data across all, all part of the whole organisation, whether it's HR through to sales or customer service or marketing or you know, operations. I think data is still incredibly siloed. You know, so it's customer service data, HR data, and the two don't necessarily cross over. I think we're starting to see the signs and whether social is the catalyst that has enabled, not enabled, but has triggered that happening, where you're starting to see, you know, departments like customer service and marketing starting to work more closely together. And so there will come a point at which that data starts to come together. Mm. Inevitably, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of, and again, I see an evolution from military to businesses mm. to personal. I really do, having been in, in all three spheres. I agree. <laughs> and I think the military have learned to bring all the data together thoroughly cross-reference it, thoroughly fuse it, thoroughly normalise it, do the whole thing. And businesses are in that curve still after 30 years, because it isn't easy, and the individual's at the very beginning of the curve. The difference for the individual is it's got to be done automatically, because they ain't going to be sitting there to do an SAP implementation, thank you very much. <laughs> right? um, and that's the challenge. But it's just take, learn from the military, learn from businesses, individuals will be there mm -hmm. over time. Do you think there's, I mean, there's, um, you know, one of the, the things, De Declan, I think you said about um, there being some people who have the, the need to know in order to create yeah, yeah. The, the tools and, you know, um, uh, whether at some point we're, we're, aren't we being, just be, aren't we being overly optimistic here that, we, you know, actually open, you know, all this data is just being used by a uh, small, young, educated, techie, metropolitan elite um, and they have the political smarts and, you know, kind of, frankly, they use it for, we'll use data and say, well, that is cool, we understand it, you know, most of the rest, the, the rest of, uh, uh, the rest of us don't care, don't know, and it will continue that way. I guess if, if somebody sees a benefit from, from the, the eventual, you know, output of the data, then, then, then they will want to use it. You know, they, they won't feel that they're, they're cut off and they won't feel that they're not part of, you know, the, this, this I idealised kind of urban city dweller who, who's plugged into everything. Um, so my, my, my daughter, she's four years old, and she'll, she'll come up to me and say, Daddy, Daddy, take a photo of me. Um, and she'll jump off the sofa and I'll, I'll take a photo of her. And she's, she'll say to me, can you put it on Facebook? Because she, she's, she she's wants to show off already. She's four years old and she, she already sees, sees a benefit of, of sharing, you know, Certain, certain information because she thinks it's kind of cool. And there's always going to people, be people that, you know, no matter where they are, what walks of life, there's going to be something that they're going to want to take advantage of that, that comes out of, you know, the, the eventual um, escalation of, of data to, to something more, more tangible. So I, I don't think it's just for, you know, the elite or the technologically elite. They're, you know, there are people that, that don't care about the data. They might be four years old, but they do care about the result of the data. I mean, as regards open data, it's being used by very large companies. And if you think of national statistics, which are, you know, one of the, the biggest repositories <laughs> of information that's used by most companies, I'm sure most of you will have used national statistical data in some way, and particularly um, things like the census. Um, if you're in marketing and communications, you will have used census data in, at some point. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, I don't think this is about, you know, startups. We do have startups who are, um, as part of the ODI, we um, are incubating currently about 10 startups who are specialising in using open data to create businesses uh, and things like that. But one of the, I, I teach part of our business um, part of using open data, and it's really, which is why I was asking, you know, do you think that there's an, an understanding that data is across all parts of a business? Because every part of a business will probably have a, you know, data, will probably be using all publishing data in some way, and can be uh, probably using some open data within that, because whether that's government data or other companies who've published data, uh, and whether that's also to improve supply chain, whether it's to um, improve your trust and transparency um, and your brand. It, there's so many different applications because data is just really, it's just stuff. <laughs> it's just stuff. It, it, it's not, that's my best definition, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really, it's neutral as, as regards what people want to do. Mm. Yeah. So I, I've had that. As I said, I've had the joys of looking into some of those government data sets. Some of them are terribly done. And I, they really need to get clean. They, they, they do, <laughs> and they're, they're very, very difficult to query. And, and you do, you do yeah. need to be someone who's, who's you know, had quite a bit of training in order to, to actually get any value at all out, yeah. out, out of that. Um, 
Is I'm that, I'm the, not first, sure, is is that, that the kind of like a first step then we still need to be going through is to actually making the, the data that we do need that would actually uh, to make it just more open and less so sort of the, difficult the, to deal with. Can I make yeah, the policy around so why the data is released in the first place? So the, the policy was better to release uh, than not at all mm -hmm. um, so that it began this whole movement. Um, and there was a, Tim Berners-Lee sort of had a very basic s set of standards around the quality of data, which was literally format. So f one star was PDF, two stars Excel, uh, three stars was CSV, and at the top was semantic link data. It was quite a leap between three stars and five stars. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the initial trying to get this going was release it and um, allow people to see it so that faults can be found and so that the data can be improved rather than hide it forever. No one knows the mistakes um, and so that um, the, no, no improvements can ever be made. So uh, uh, just on the quality, yeah. there, there is a rationale. But we're overthinking this. We are definitely <laughs> overthinking it. I was just right. explaining the policy. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're overthinking it, okay? Look, businesses first implemented SAP and various other things in the 80s, right? Do you think that the directors of the business that authorised that had a scooby about the data formats, the data standards, or how to analyse the data? Did they? No. Right? What they knew was that there was a business imperative. They wanted information. They wanted some benefit. And you should always start from there. And it's just very simple. And then eventually that will drive you down to the data. So you start from the business benefit you're after. So whether that is doing better customer service, whether that is being able to link things together. And once you do that, then you work out how you can get it, where you get the data from. Then you have to understand open data, if that's a source. You have to understand the big data, and you have to understand personal data and things like that. And then you leave it to the next level down to work out how they're going to do it, like always in, this, in, in any game of a business. Right? And then it comes down into that point. Now, there is one subtle difference to that, is knowing the art of the possible. Right, because that then feeds back to the top of what the decision making is. So if you know the art of the possible by, by talking to people like us who are a little bit too geeky sometimes, then you can make the decisions. But just come at it top down. Don't worry about whether the data sets are there at the beginning. Work out what you want and miraculously, I will guarantee you, the data will arrive. Right? You'll find a way. <laughs> but is, is that not, you know, leaving the, the details till the end, maybe, maybe you know, it would be useful if there were models that actually you know, if, if all of the government data sets were of a standard model, would that make it easier then for people to come in and say, actually, we can do this in a more efficient way? If, if, all, if all data comes yes. in, a, in a unified kind of format. Do you want me to be really controversial and say that Tim and I would have a major blazing row? Go on, Tim wants the semantic web, which is a linked data set, and I completely disagree. It'll never work. All right, because it takes too much knowledge to do it. Mm. You need a normalized data set, and you need to just damn well get on and agree it. Have and that's a very techy uh, di discussion about that. But unless they, it's like trying to work with 200 different languages and have the translations versus working in English, all right? And it's a fundamental difference. And I tell you, the military tried to do the linked data set type approach for years. I made all my money and sold my business to Lockheed Martin because I went, nah, let's go normalized and we changed the world's military overnight. I mean, when, when we are, so, and I'm, I'm, you, but that's no, really no, no. I'm, not, I'm not Tim's representative on earth in this, in this instance. Um, I, I, don't, I, I couldn't even begin to be qualified to do that. Um, all I can say is when we are talking to organizations, you have to think about who's going to be using your data and how are they going to be using That's it. That's where we agree. And so um, we often are saying, well, you know, this is actually the year of the CSV, for CSV, comma-separated values. This is getting really yes, geeky Yes, yes, I know. Um, but, you know, that, that's something that anyone can download. Um, but it's not always useful for, every, you know, every purpose. Right. So, you know, whilst on one hand you might want this, the web of data, which is things connected to one another, um, and it has its uses. You also, you know, for other purposes, want people just to be able to download a CSV and be able to do something with it. Okay, no, so, that's, you know, anyway, that's, that's, that's way uh, too and, 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 <laughs> and, and to the theological and, and discussion sorry, yeah. there. Right? So, um, uh, perhaps we, um, based on, uh, you know, kind of with, uh, uh, with her, the Blue Borum's, uh, Sheila's interest, as she's, and we've talked already, uh, that have been mentioned of this. We've had a mother's memoirs and two novels. Uh, Recall. I've got the, another the book as well. You know, kind of the, um, <laughs> oh. stories. Uh, you know, kind of we relay information through narratives, don't we? I mean, data is just 
it's just facts, it's stuff. Um, so, what's the you know what's the potential for you know kind of organisations to use this to tell you know uh, use this material to tell better stories, um, and how to how can they actually you know what what should be their focus on? on we have a the course narrative? on this. Sorry, I had to promote that bit. <laughs> okay, go on then. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I've been dominating the kind of yeah. thing. But um, yeah. so it, it depends on what story you're trying to tell, and, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, as with anything, it, what, what's the objective? Um, and we can tell stories in many, many different ways. Whether it's just using one small. So w when I uh, when I was when I teach this journalism course, the the big mistake that most journalists make is this thing called data journalism, and you know everyone wants to be a data journalist. And it's like, well, you use data every day in your stories already. You know, if you are have, putting a fact into a story, whether it's saying 15% of X, you are using data in a story. It's not complicated. And I think we've made it to be very complicated. Mm. We've made it into, oh, it must have a visualization. It must be this. It must be that. No, no, no. Data is just some stuff for which anyone can put it into a story. I think it, it's more what stories would we like to tell and how data can be used to maybe enhance that rather than the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit of a rant, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'd agree though, that's the yeah. point that I was making, which is where we violently agree, is that it is about working out what you want first and then go into the data to find out what you need. But you've got to actually work out what you want first. As I say, the data upwards continue the art of the possible, but that's all. Work out what you want, what the story you want to tell, or what the story you want your customer, whether that's internal or external, to experience is, and then work out what data would support that. Now you can then get that data, and beautiful because you've got open data and big data and other personal data to do it. And if you can't get it, work out how you can get it. It's very yeah. simple. But start with the story. I'd say we also use two two methods. It's one story first, and do, but there is a sometimes um, reason why you might want to do data first. But to do that, it's far more expensive. You have to have a lot more skill, and you have to then be able to trawl through and look and have a lot of context. Someone who's very knowledgeable in an area to be able to spot where the story might be. If you're using the triangle, that top those top two bits where it's um, knowledge and wisdom. That requires not just one person, it often requires a team of people. So someone to be able to first of all know where the data is, how to download it, maybe clean it, maybe put it into some graphical form yeah. initially so you can analyse it. And then have someone who knows enough about an area to say, oh right, oh look, I've always wondered about that relationship there. It looks like it is happening and there you have a story. But it's a lot more effort going yeah. from, story for, um, from data first. Mm. So this is, this is interesting because it, it relates very much to the, um, the development of our LMI product that we're looking to launch at the end of the summer. Um, so we, we initially had an idea that using the Universal Job Match data, we could understand what the labour market looked like from a supply and demand point of view. Uh, but we didn't know really what questions we were going to answer. And until we had the questions that we were going to answer, we didn't know what we, would gonna, we were going to present. Um, so, you know, we, we worked with some, some statisticians and they were able to come up with a list of, of several hundred potential <laughs> statistical indicators. You know, this is at the level of information now. Um, but we thought, no, we can't present that as our product. We can't present statistical indicators because nobody's going to understand that. We need to know what, what the day-to-day, -day, you know, job is of the person who's going to look at this portal and what the questions are going to be, you know, at the front of their mind. And we need to go from there and kind of work backwards and then fill in the data where, where it needs to come in. And this is exactly what we've experienced with the product. We want to make it so that it's useful. So that, that's really the way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think we've completely lost the art of storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it sort of got clouded over in all the sort of business speak and the, the need to validate everything we do. And I, th I think we're gradually returning to that. And, you know, you, you may well have seen it over the last few years, the increase in the amount of people talking about stories and storytelling. And my, my hope is it doesn't just become another sort of tool in the kit bag and that actually we learn properly how to tell the art of stories. But it is absolutely key to know actually what you want to tell the story about. Um, I was running a workshop in the Middle East recently with the, one of the departments of statistics and planning, and they had all this data, more data than they would know what to do with, but they had no idea of how to get it out, of how to make it interesting. You know, and you thought, there are so many stories in there waiting to be told, mm. and actually the issue wasn't around the data, it was around simply 
how do we talk about this? How do we communicate this? And I think that's the big challenge as well. It's quite interesting that actually our tagline is get the complete story of you, right? And so that, I hadn't thought about that before I came here today, actually, that that is the tagline. It is about what that makes as an emotive connection. Because if you don't have the emotive connection when it comes to personal data, you have nothing. Yeah, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's, um, I'm mindful that we're running time because that's almost a really, uh, no, it is. It's a brilliant way to finish. Um, so, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and a minute, a minute ahead of time as well. Would you so like my kind of, book recommendation? Then? So, um, right, okay. Well, well, actually, no. You've had, we've had two book recommendations. Uh, we have book recommendations. Go on, stories, things, because this is long form storytelling, narrative accounts. Uh, each one of you, you've got to recommend a book for us to read. Oh, blimey. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go right off, off piece. Yep. All right, and I'm going to say uh, Biggles and the Cruise of the Condor. Right. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you that Biggles and the Cruise of the Condor because my whole life is based on Biggles, right? Because I read that at five years old, and I have one of the world's largest collection of Biggles books. But it ended up me being here today. I can relate a whole story back to why Biggles and the Cruise of the Condor ended up with me being here today as a data person. And it's got, you'll think, when you read the book, nothing, but it's, uh, it's a fascinating story when he goes around South America. There you go. Right off <laughs> the east. Fantastic. No, um, I'm going to be, been... I'm gonna be really boring. Um, so I would recommend a book called The Clue Train Manifesto, if you've not read it, published in 1999. Uh, Clue Train Manifesto. And it's basically um, four guys who got together, I think they're all at university, um, talking about what they think the next 10 years will look like. So they talked a lot about, in 1999, many of the things that are happening today, which weren't around then. So Super slim. So it's a yeah, really it's great. Thing. And you can go <laughs> online to cluetrain.com or .org, yeah. and it's just got 95 theses. Just read those, and you'll be fine as well. <laughs> Declan? All right, so um, I'm, I'm a sci-fi geek. You can probably tell I'm a sci-fi <laughs> geek just by looking at me. Um, I'm reading a book at the moment. It's called The Quantum Thief. Um, now, there, there's a... There's a a plot that goes through it, but, but it's relevant to this um, particular discussion because everyone who lives on this particular Mars colony, they all have complete control over what personal information they provide to anyone else around them. Yeah. And it's almost like they have an internal sixth sense where they can, you know, release, you know, you can release your name or you can release a lot more about yourself or you can even share memories. And it, was, it seems relevant here because, um, you know, it's about control and ownership of your own personal data. And that story kind of takes it to the extreme, whereby people actually have absolute control over their personal data. They can even blur their image in front of people so that no one can see what they look like if they're that bothered. So yeah, that, the, the quantum thief. Yeah, the quantum <laughs> and Catherine. So I've recommended two novels. I'm actually going to recommend a, a piece of non-fiction, and it's called Sex Bombs and Burgers. And it actually um, goes back to, I see Jimmy and I have swapped now, because it, it, it tells the story of how most innovation has come from those three industries. So military, this, the story you were telling about, which what, what made me kind of twig, um, just around the use of how military innovation then eventually appears in um, the society and, and normal use. So, you know, everything from this pen through, through to, um, you know, radar, all sorts of technologies that have been originally in those three industries, so the food industry, military, and unfortunately the sex industry, um, kind of come through into different uses. So it's a really fascinating historical look at how innovation happens. Well, there you are. You've had, um, you've had uh, a terrific sort of uh, array of, um, uh, of opinions, of ideas, and some book recommendations. Um, I, I've, I've been scribbling notes furiously because, of course, I've got to do some summary of, uh, of uh, the, whole, uh, the whole day at the end of the afternoon. So um, uh, what I will do, though, is just at the moment is, uh, say thank you very much to Catherine, to Declan, to Guy, and to Julian for a terrific panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.